Hi, I'm Andy Van Clunen, CEO of National Skills Coalition. And I'm pleased to welcome you to NSC's first Fireside Chat, a series of conversations with national leaders about the importance of sustained federal investments in the skills of America's working people, particularly now that we need to be including everyone in our nation's post-pandemic economic recovery. I'm truly honored to be joined for this first chat with Secretary of Labor and former Boston Mayor Marty Walsh. We're going to be talking about his efforts, both past and current, to fight for investments and skills training to help build equitable economic growth. Then, after my discussion with Secretary Walsh, I'll be joined by a couple of my esteemed colleagues for their take on the Secretary's comments. But before I jump in with Secretary Walsh, let me give you a word or two about National Skills Coalition. For the past two decades, NSC has been fighting for a new national commitment to inclusive, high quality skills training so that more working people in America might have access to a better life. And so more local businesses might see sustained growth within their rapidly changing industries. Last fall, in response to the pandemic, our coalition's leaders released Skills for an Inclusive Economic Recovery a policy agenda to address the disproportionate impact of the COVID recession on workers of color, immigrants, women, and people without a college degree, as well as on our nation's local small and medium-sized businesses. Since then, we've been working with tens of thousands of stakeholders to comprise our coalition, representing business, labor, community organizations, community colleges, and the public sector, to fight for generation-defining investments in high-quality, inclusive skills training so that it's part of our nation's economic recovery responses, both in Washington and out in the states. So I'm thrilled to have Secretary Walsh join me today to talk about what he saw as a mayor regarding the value of skills investments as a strategy for local economic prosperity and about how he is now bringing that experience to his role as our nation's Secretary of Labor. Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for joining me today. Andy, thanks for having me today. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to the conversation. For sure. All right, well, so let's get right into it. So this is August, most folks are on vacation, but you've been busy uh, and you've been out there a lot lately, including talking about how important it is that we think about investing in the American worker and American workers' skills as part of how it is that we're gonna build this economy back. Could you talk to me a little bit about the $100 billion investment that President Biden called for in his Build Back Better plan? What does it aim to do and why is it so necessary? No, it's true. Well, first and foremost, again, thank you for having me today. And this is a really important conversation. Uh, I've been traveling all over the country. I've hit 20 states now, probably in the last couple of months, uh, and talking to different people in different constituencies about where we are in the economy, where we are in the country, where we are in the pandemic. And you know, President Biden has stated this more than one time that uh, as, as America, we're at, we're at an inflection point in our history. Uh, workforce development is certainly at the heart of how we meet this moment. Uh, we look at our workforce uh, and what the workforce has been, been through over the last year. Uh, we look at the pace of changing technology. Uh, we look at the deep, longstanding challenges that are facing women, uh, people of color, uh, marginalized communities all across America, pre-pandemic and and obviously we'll be post pandemic too if we don't do something different here. Uh, we, 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 and we look at millions of good jobs uh, that we're gonna create through the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill and what's been going on in our country. So it's clear that this country has never needed workforce training more than it does right now. Uh, this is a moment in history that depends on bold action. And it's what the president has proposed. As you mentioned, the president has proposed a build back better agenda and called for $100 billion in proven it has to be proven workforce development programs targeted to workers, employers, and, 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 and neighborhoods and communities all across the country that need it the most. Uh, in the Department of Labor, we're prepared to bring these investments to the American worker. And we're certainly laying down the, the foundation, the groundwork right now. Just a, a couple of quick points here. Uh, registered apprenticeships is one of them in industries like manufacturing, cybersecurity, and healthcare. I, I was in uh, Toledo, Ohio the other day uh, at a company uh, first solar who building um, solar, um, solar solar modules mm -hmm. and, and quite on here in America and really the need for workers in that industry is going to be important. Uh, sector based training uh, to help small and medium sized businesses that have been hit hard by the pandemic, but uh, so we can help them access the talent they need. Uh, community college uh, workforce training programs within the colleges. The college already there, the infrastructure is there, uh, and now we can add to that. 
uh, career and technical education programs in our high schools. I've heard that a lot. That you know, people would say, when I was a kid, I, and we had a program in there, and there's not enough that consistently across the country. And, and we can't forget uh, people who are involved in the juvenile uh, or the justice system, uh, returning citizens. So we need to make sure we have reentry opportunities. And uh, you know, we're ready to invest in, in our nation's workforce and and to continue to put equity in our economy and move our economy for, forward. Uh, so we, we need to offer not just some people the opportunity uh, for success, but we need to, the tools to, to make sure that everyone can, can access these jobs and these programs, these opportunities. So uh, that's kind of one of the things I think that are really important. This, this is a moment uh, in time for our workforce development uh, that, that we can meet only if we work together. So uh, that's, that's kind of a long answer to your question. Good answer. It's a good answer because it's important. It's not just that we're making bold investments but we're making them in the things that we know work for, for businesses and for working people, registered apprenticeships, uh, sector-based training, all the things that you named, like we're making smart investments in addition to making bold investments. And that seems to be really important. And as you said, we wanna do it in a way that it's including everybody in this economic recovery. Now, a lot of folks know that uh, prior to you taking this job in Washington, you were the mayor of the great city of Boston. Uh, what folks may not know is that Job training was a big part of what you advocated for there as part of the equity and economic opportunity agenda in the city. You know, what did you learn about these issues there on the ground uh, in Boston? And, and what is that teaching us about how important this has to be as we're bringing this conversation to, to DC? Well, I certainly know that uh, what I learned firsthand as mayor, uh, giving somebody an opportunity to access a, a job training program with a job connected to it, uh, what it does for their neighborhoods and what it can do for their communities. Uh, uh, you know, in the city, I'll just give you a couple I did. Uh, one was to create a program before as the mayor called Building Pathways, was, which was a pre-apprenticeship program to allow uh, people of color and women to get into building trades. Uh, that's transformative. That creates people put them on a pathway for good wages, but also a long-term <clears throat> health care and also pension plans uh, to get able to get a pension. Uh, I was able to do the Boston uh, EMS Academy uh, we wanted to make sure that our EM, EMTs in Boston, our paramedics, uh, we, they were diverse and, and Boston residents and Boston people that wanted to get chances and we're able to do an academy there and we're able to have lots of success there. Uh, our Office of Economic Development provided technical assistance uh, to small women-owned and minority-owned businesses in, in multiple languages. Uh, obviously, we know our small businesses are, are, are the lifeline to our cities, all across, our cities all across this country and creating that opportunity. Uh, we created an office called Office of Women's Advancement uh, and worked with Boston-based businesses to sign on to what was called a talent compact. So employers were in partners uh, and their partners were tackling persistent issues of gender and wage uh, inequities. Our Office of Immigrant Advancement, another office that was created uh, to, to make sure to identify job training uh, and economic opportunities for our immigrant communities in Boston. That wasn't a new office. That was The, the office was formerly known as the the Office of New Bostonians, but we, we looked at it a whole different way. You know, New Bostonians, when it was created, but welcoming people to the city of Boston, but immigrant advancements about how do we advance those, those opportunities. And so we, we worked in with programs like that uh, to, to make sure that we created uh, special pathways. And, you know, it, it was really, and we also had the Greater Boston American Apprentice Initiatives uh, that the city led in partnership with local industry and community colleges. So, you know, I saw firsthand the, the transformation in people's lives by, by making investments, but also by having uh, a system in place that, that help people. Now, we didn't, we didn't get to finish the job um, mm -hmm. because there's so much need there. And when I think about, when I think about the investments that President Biden is advocating for um, on a national level, I just think about being able to do that across the country in urban America and rural America, uh, you know, in, in, all across communities of color. Uh, we have such a tremendous opportunity and and, and these, these programs, if, if they're done right and scaled up, the outcomes are there. And, and that's something that we have to continue to continue to move forward together. And, and I probably should put a little more emphasis on, as well as working with businesses. I mean, I think that bringing businesses to the table and partners to the table is so key. In Boston, we're so successful because of that. Uh, this is not about operating in silos. This is operating as one unit together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, those partnerships are crucial. And I think the point that you make about Boston figured it out and did an incredible job with all of the different programs you talked about and lo local areas throughout this country, we should be giving them the same chance with some help from Washington to come up with their strategies for how it is that they wanna do this 
both for the local, local working folks and for businesses as well. Um, so you've been out there, we talked about, you've been out there talking a lot about these issues, but since we kind of brought this issue about workers and businesses, I know that your colleague from the cabinet, uh, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo has out, also been out there talking with you and you've been out there together saying that this is good for business, this is good for working people. And you know, this is an issue, investing in people to help them advance to a good career and bring local value to local businesses. Um, this is something that sells across a lot of different stakeholders. It polls really great uh, with Democrats, with Republicans, with independents. There's a ton of support out there for us making this a big part of the president's recovery agenda. But what more do you think we need to be doing to make the case about how urgent these investments are as we're figuring this stuff out in Washington over the next month or so? Yeah, I don't think we have to look too far uh, to, to see where... Uh, and why we need to make these investments. I, I mean, uh, you know, your organization has been helpful in helping put some of these ideas together. So thank you for that. Uh, I think about, you know, I, you know, March 23rd, I became the Secretary of Labor. Uh, up to that point, I was the mayor of the city of Boston. And I knew the neighborhoods where we need to make investments. I knew the areas where we needed to really focus on. Um, and, and I did that working with unions and working with organizations and businesses, large and small, and corporations and nonprofits and, and, and philanthropists, quite honestly. Uh, now I've had the chance to be in this role for almost five months, uh, and I've gone across the country uh, enough to see uh, areas that are doing well, parts of states that are doing well, and parts of states that aren't doing well. And, and I don't think there really has to be um, an explanation to anyone of why we should make these investments. Um, we have never seen these types of investments made in the history of our country. We did see that during the New Deal, uh, these, a lot of these programs were created, uh, but we've never seen these investments. And these investments that we're talking about today uh, are so key. I mean, like I said to you, I, I was in, I was in um, Ohio the other day, I was at first, um, uh, first Solar, and we were talking about these panels, and, and they're building a $680 million dollar uh, facility to build solar panels. And I was talking to the CEO and he already had a, a, another building there that it employed like um, I don't know, a thousand or so people. And, and I said to him, would it help you if we partnered together to create a program, a pre-apprentice or, or a training program that would help teach the basics of manufacturing? And there was a Peloton plant that was open a little a couple weeks ago, groundbreaking a couple weeks down, ago before down the road in Ohio. And he's like, yes. So I think we have to start thinking outside the box. I think if you talk to, I was just on, literally I was on a call uh, before this with a, with a, um, a group of um, elect, local elected officials. And there was three or 400 people on the call. And, you know, I was talking to them. But if, if I had a chance to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they would all tell me the need for workforce development, job training, apprenticeship program, because most, most communities in our country are dealing with the issues of inequity. They're dealing with people that are underemployed. We're coming out of a pandemic. So I, I do think that the urgency is, is now. And I think more people realize it than we realize. So I don't think we have to explain to anyone why to do it. I think it's just a matter of making sure we make these investments because you make these investments in people, in job training, you know who's gonna benefit? Not only them and their family, but the companies, the economy, our country. Absolutely. Um, well, Mr. Secretary, you know, National Skills Coalition, we're ready to work with you to help take that argument uh, to whoever need to talk to in Washington about these issues and all over the country. I just want to thank you for joining me today and for everything that you've been doing as a champion on these issues for us to really create those generation defining investments and in high quality, inclusive skills training. So all those folks that have been most impacted by this pandemic including workers of color, low wage workers, other folks who've lost jobs aren't coming back, that we're gonna give them a chance to get into some of the skilled jobs that we're creating with other investments in the president's Build Back Better agenda. So thank you so much for all the work you've done. Thanks for being part of this conversation today and looking forward to working with you on it in the future. Thank you, Andy, thank you. Uh, so now I wanna get some reactions from some leaders on the front lines who've been advocating on these issues, both in Washington and out in the states for years. How is it that we can make high quality, inclusive skills training and education available to all of America's workers and businesses, particularly as part of this economic recovery? So let me introduce our panel. 
Uh, first, we have Brad Markell. He's the executive director of the AFL-CIO Industrial Unions Council and the Federation's Working for America Institute. Hey, Brad. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me. Good to have you here. Uh, next, Allison Denbeck. She's vice president of education and labor advocacy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Hey, Allison. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me, too. Thanks for joining. And Alex Camardell, he's the Director of Workforce Policy at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, otherwise known as America's Black Think Tank. Alex, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. Great. Okay, so let's get into the discussion here. Alex, I'm going to start with you. So, you know, the Secretary talked about the importance of investments in skills training if we want to make those workers most impacted by this pandemic, including workers of color, so that they have a chance for some equitable access to the jobs that we're hoping to create with this infrastructure package and with other things that we're investing in in DC at the federal level. The Joint Center, you've been a leader on this kind of issue. Um, what are your reflections on what you heard from the Secretary today? Thanks, Andy. And, and first, I just want to thank you, uh, NSC and the Secretary for championing these investments. I mean, we believe they fundamentally modernize our nation's workforce system. Um, as you all know, workforce development funding for struggling workers has fallen to historic lows. And uh, the US was spending 25% less in workforce programming in, tw in 2020 than we were before the Great Recession uh, more than a decade ago. And that chronic underinvestment in affordable and high quality education and training has made it more difficult for low income folks and people of color to navigate the labor market. So everything the secretary shared is true in our view. And I particularly appreciate the concern about the evolving barriers that are facing workers of color. We share that concern at the Joint Center specifically for black workers who felt the brunt of this pandemic from all sides. Uh, it's crucial that we keep in mind the context that we're in from a race equity perspective, which historically has been ignored. The COVID-19 pandemic and the economic downturn was felt sharply by Black communities with higher rates of unemployment, hunger, housing insecurity, and infection rates disproportionately affecting Black households. These disparities stem from persistent patterns of anti-Black racism embedded in this nation's healthcare, housing, education, policing and economic laws. Um, however, COVID-19 did not initiate the disproportionate impact on Black communities, right? Uh, we need to remember that even as this country was experiencing its lowest unemployment rate and longest period of economic expansion in recent history up until March 2020, um, Black communities fell further behind others in terms of wages, employment, and other measures of economic security. Today, even as unemployment rates are creeping back to pre-pandemic levels, unemployment rates remain two to three times higher for black workers compared to white workers. And so to build back better means we can't return to the pre-pandemic status quo, but we're already starting to return to that with these stubborn gaps in employment. And now is not the time to hold back. Big investments in workforce training and job creation can help change that. The administration has a duty to address equity concerns by reversing that chronic underinvestment in the nation's workforce development system. An underinvestment, mind you, spans the lives of black and brown folks in early education, K through 12, and most notably for today in our post-secondary opportunities. Black youth and young adults disproportionately live in states, particularly in the South, where there are little to no state general funds spent on skills training and there's deep resistance to raising revenue to cover the costs of training. For example, in Georgia where I live, the state spends zero dollars in state funds on registered apprenticeships and short-term skills training outside of the technical college system and instead relies heavily on one-time grant dollars to administer programs. So if, if advancing equity is part of the administration's agenda, we need federal investment into the workforce system it would be a lifeline for workers of color, immigrants, women, and other systematically excluded groups from training opportunities because of that chronic underinvestment. In fact, Andy, I actually love how the secretary put it. I think he put it best by suggesting that we need bold investments in people to ensure a just and equitable recovery for our workforce. So that's my reflection uh, on behalf of the Joint Center and just really am happy and excited about the energy that the secretary brings into uh, advancing equity through our workforce policy and our uh, fiscal policy. 
Excellent. Thanks, Alex. And you make such a, an important point, which is this has been a devastating year and a half for workers of color and other folks who've been uh, sometimes left on the margins of our skilled labor market. But these were problems that preceded March 2020. So we have work to right. do, not just to address what's happened over the past year and a half, but we have we have decades of disinvestment in certain groups of folks that we need to make up for and what it is that we do moving forward coming into this recovery, don't you think? That's right. Thanks. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great. All right, Brad, let me turn to you. So, um, so Brad, you know, um, uh, Marty Walsh uh, wasn't just a local mayor. He was also a local labor leader. He helped lead the building trades in Boston for years, where they use skills training as one of the ways to build new pathways for folks into, into that sector. So can I hear some of your thoughts about what the secretary had to say and why investing in people and quality skills training is so important to the labor movement? Yeah, well, listen, uh, th again, thanks for having the AFL-CIO. And uh, I, you know, I have to agree a lot with some of the things uh, Alex said off the, right off the top. Uh, I, the, here's a quick story about uh, Secretary Walsh. You know, uh, he helped the labor movement put together a deal to uh, do all the solar panels in the Archdiocese of Boston and was able to pull a bunch of underserved uh, kids into those opportunities because it was like one huge job where they needed people. So he's been at this for quite some time. And, uh, you know, we're poised for a insanely large federal investment, finally, I would say. And I do think, you know, employer uh, contributions have uh, into training have fallen. Uh, they're often skewed for management towards management. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, competitive reasons and, and and especially in manufacturing where I'm from, costs are very, very, very tight. Uh, but the federal government can drive quality programs. They can drive programs that um, help on diversity. They can drive programs that sync up with some of the important goals that we have around climate change and economic growth and supply chains and, and economic security. So there's uh, you know, a lot of money that's being invested uh, outside of training and the training um, investment really has to sync up with that and help achieve those goals, right? There's a commitment, for instance, for 40% of the benefits of climate investments to go to uh, environmental justice communities. And th that investment has to be accompanied by a chance for those folks to get those jobs and get the training they need to do it. So uh, I think the last thing I would say is that you know, some of the things the secretary said about good jobs and, and, you know, the Biden administration has talked a lot about union jobs, the job quality matters. And it's really important if we're going to move people from lower paying, lower quality jobs to better jobs, then the workforce investment dollars have to skew toward that purpose. They have to skew towards higher paying jobs and not just sort of rotating investments in, in, in low road employers, but they also have to skew towards pulling disadvantaged people into those. You got to make the connection between the new hired paying job and, and the person who really needs it. So I think the Secretary Walsh is, you know, really understands this stuff from his gut. And we're very excited about uh, the opportunity to make these investments. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, this, the idea about syncing up these investments, we can't be making investments in creating jobs, building bridges, building a new clean energy infrastructure if we're not going to make sure that folks have access to those jobs. The investing in the people part has to be going along with it. And I think, you know, we want to make sure, and I know that you uh, and your affiliates want to make sure that those two things are happening together when folks are making local decisions about how to use these federal dollars. But we got to make sure the dollars are in there first, for sure. So Allison, let me turn to you. Um, so, you know, Secretary Walsh, he talked about the needs of workers, but he talked a lot about the needs of business and industry as well. Um, and also how that's gonna help not just uh, local firms, but it's gonna help the overall economy. So I'm curious how much that resonates with things that you hear from business folks, from local chambers that you work with in the course of your day-to-day -day work. Thanks, Andy. Um, actually, everything that Secretary Walsh and Alex and Brad highlighted in their comments is fits very well with where the, the chamber sees things and where our membership is. Uh, these were long-standing workforce challenges um, 
all pre-pandemic, but what we've seen over the last year and a half is that the pandemic has uh, exacerbated those issues. And so it was really encouraging to hear the secretary focus his discussion on the fact that this isn't a partisan issue, that uh, there's a real need for everyone to work together to face these workforce challenges. And to be honest, we see this actually very similar to how we saw the vaccine development, that America needs an operation work speed approach for filling jobs. And the chamber has done a significant amount of work in this space before the pandemic, but more than ever, we really are hearing from our companies, uh, our member companies. I, most of the time people think about the multinational corporations and that's what they think of when they think of the chamber, but we're hearing it from our small employers who are also our members and they're the ones who are also, you know, on the main streets all across this country. And they're all saying that finding skilled workers is either the number one or the number two challenge that they are facing. So, you know, you probably saw that the latest Bureau of Labor Statistics data show job open openings are at a historic high, but what you probably don't know is that 90% of local chambers are also saying that their, that their employers are struggling to hire workers. So, the chamber uh, is, sees this as a situation where there's too many people without jobs and there's too many jobs without the right people to fill them. So with all this in mind, actually the chamber launched a, what we're calling our America Works Initiative uh, several months ago. And much of it does, uh, does fill what, the, what Secretary Walsh, Walsh outlined as needs. You know, it's trying to help Americans acquire the skills they need to fill today's open jobs. It's removing longstanding barriers to, uh, to people trying to find work, particularly people who are trying to find work now. And that includes childcare, which is obviously not in the secretary's purview, but things like veteran hiring and second chance hiring. It also means that we need to improve educational and job training opportunities for the jobs of tomorrow because we can't just fix a problem temporarily and not deal with the longer term pipeline of talent. And then obviously there's also from the chamber's perspective, something the secretary didn't mention, but is kind of the fourth piece in this puzzle and that's welcoming global talent through Im immigration reforms. And I'm obviously happy to go into more detail about any of those things, but Maybe I'll leave it at the moment by just saying that some of these are things that employers can do on their own immediately. And we're trying to work with our local chambers and our member companies to, to do that. And that's through employer-led programs like the U.S. Chamber Foundation's Talent Pipeline Management Program or by improving employers' uh, out-of-date data systems through programs like the Chamber's T3 Innovation Network and the Jobs Data Exchange. Um, but there's also implementing practices, uh, best practices like veterans hiring and second chance hiring. Um, but there's also things that need to, to be done through policy and it requires a little more bipartisan comprehensive change. Uh, we're very excited to see things like the historic investment from the uh, Department of Commerce in their $3 billion grant that was recently announced, uh, funded through the American Rescue Plan. We also hope that as things continue to move forward, that we'll take the time to do it bipartisanly and make the investments necessary, since those investments uh, are also really important for change and improvement. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, uh, we work a lot with local businesses and local chambers, and we hear the exact same things that, that you mentioned. Um, and they're really looking for a good partner in the federal government. They, they want to be able to have to be part of conversations with folks on the ground to kind of figure out what their particular industry needs, but they can't upskill an entire community's workforce all on their own. They need to have somebody who's there, including to make sure the folks who've never worked in that industry get a chance to get their first, get their first foot in the door. And so I've been really encouraged by the way that the business community has been a great partner on kind of making that case uh, with folks in Congress and in other places in Washington. Um, and I just think that local business leaders are amongst the best spokespeople on this because they are the ones that are often looking to local community organizations, local colleges, local workforce boards to try to find their, give folks their first skilled job in a new industry. Yeah. Well, great. This has been a really uh, uh, energizing conversation. Uh, you all, I know, are working with your organizations and your members to kind of move these conversations forward. Um, 
we're looking forward to continuing to work with your groups. We're looking forward to working with uh, the Secretary of Labor and the rest of the folks in the, in the Biden cabinet. Um, but I've just really been inspired by what you all had to say today. So thanks, Alex, Brad, and Allison. I really appreciate you putting in the time uh, for this discussion today. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Andy. Yes. Uh, and thanks again to Secretary Walsh for spending some time talking to us about this as well. Uh, so then for those of you who are watching today, if you feel as passionate as Alex and Brad and Allison do about these issues, and you want to make sure that workforce development is part of an inclusive economic recovery, the National Skills Coalition has an opportunity for you to make your voice heard. So go to nationalskillsfiresidechat.com and sign your organization onto a letter calling on Congress to fully fund President Biden's proposed $100 billion investment in workforce development as part of his Build Back Better plan. And please stay tuned for announcements about upcoming fireside chats that we're gonna be having with other members of the Biden cabinet to talk about these and other pressing issues so that we can all build an inclusive economic recovery together. Watch out for more information on those events. Please take action and we'll be back in touch with you shortly. Have a good day.